thank you dr ahmed for joining us today dr ahmed will be sharing um his research on the politics of dialogue in india and uh, dr ahmed is an associate professor at the center for study of uh, development society developing societies uh, the csds as it's popularly known it's based in new delhi he works on political islam muslim politics of representation and politics of symbols in south asia and has written, written several books on the topic um dr ahmed completed his phd at the school of oriental and african studies in london thank you so much for joining us today uh, you may now begin your session and you can take up to an hour for the session and uh, the questions will follow after that yeah yeah uh, thank you very much alia for giving me this opportunity uh, i you know this has been quite a some time that uh, i'm quite frequent to this course and uh, it has always been uh, you know very encouraging and very uh, thought provoking so i also expect that we will have uh, a thought provoking and interesting discussion so uh, basically uh, what i am going to do i will make a few uh, initial remarks and then uh i'll show you the documentary which we have made and then we will have an open discussion and the purpose of this session is not to have a um, one side flow of information and analysis rather i would like you to be part of this discussion because uh of after all we are doing this entire thing on um, dialogue and if there is no dialogue then it would be completely meaningless so uh i think you must have uh, because I, when i looked at uh, the course structure i really find that you uh, have had uh, you know various very interactive sessions etc but at the moment what i am going to do is to talk about uh, what i call politics of dialogue because uh, dialogue is presented to us as if it's very noble and it is you know highly non contested entity and i don't think so so we have to if we actually look at the nature of what we call dialogue in our everyday world we find very different meanings of it and one of the meaning and especially with regard to public debates uh, you know there is a standard uh, response by our politician that there is a need to have dialogue on something so what do they mean when they refer to the term dialogue in their statements etc so this is one aspect of it which we must remember that dialogue is not and this is the first point which i would like to make uh, when it whenever it comes to politics of dialogue we must realize that dialogue is not always initiated to solve a conflict rather dialogues are always uh, especially in public debates dialogues are always evoked to maintain a contestation alive and this is the objective of my lecture today the dialogue is not always meant for getting rid of a conflict rather how to actually survive the conflict and provide a some kind of a substance to it so this is the purpose of this um like the two things which i would like to clarify first is whenever uh, at least in this lecture whenever i am referring to the term dialogue i am primarily concerned with the political debates the political debates of which we are often encountered with uh, them in the in our public discourses so that is one thing second is that the second clarification is about that dialogue is actually an act and because it is an act it is always important that which one is what is the agency uh, which is actually designated to create an uh, a possibility to a, to a dialogue in my case uh, the way in which i am going to present the film to you is basically the state how state actually represents itself 
as a mediating agency to have dialogue. So that's the second clarification. The agency is important. Third uh, important element in dialogue and that too of political debate is basically the actors. These actors are selected by the state and they are designated as some kind of representatives. So the representativeness of these actors need to be seen critically. So basically in a dialogue situation, we have three things. One, the agency, the organizer, in our case, the state. Second, the element or the, the actor who are actually seen as representative of conflicting parties. Third, Third is the modes in which a dialogue is organized. Okay, so uh, I, you know, these are large. This is the larger frame of reference in which I am going to uh, conceptualize the idea of dialogue. Okay, is that uh, all right with all of you? If you have any confusion about it, please uh, let me know uh, so that we can move ahead. Sir, what do you now, mean by in my view, sir? There are three. Uh, the contestation is actually conflict. So suppose if there is a conflict and a state would like to resolve it, uh, I think it is very important to look at uh, in what ways a state is identifying the conflicting parties, in what ways the state is offering a possibility to have to, to organize them to come together and have a dialogue. And third and the most important point is that what is the mood of this dialogue? Are there going to be meetings? Are they invited in the courts, etc.? So I think that the contestation meaning that the, this entire business in which different element, different actors are interacting with each other makes the entire process of dialogue contested. And this is what I mean by contestation. Okay, any other question or, um, or clarification? Any other question? We can move on. If anybody has any concerns, yeah. they can raise if, their hands. But this, yeah, and then uh, Dr. Hilal Ahmed will address them. Yeah, yes, Dr. Hilal. Yeah, so, uh, so let me just uh, again uh, summarize my basic framework. First thing is that, as I said, that I'm primarily concerned with public debates. Second is that uh, we have to identify uh, who is the organizer of a dialogue. The third thing is that uh, if the state is the main body that is organizing a dialogue, who are the who who are the who are basically the actors who have been identified as representative of conflicting parties? And third is the mode in which that dialogical process is organized. So these are basically. Uh, a frame. This is basically a framework in which the whole idea of dialogue is or can be interpreted. Now, what, when I am going to use this framework, uh, I would now uh, would like to mention three quick features of the politics of dialogue, and then uh, I'll introduce you to the film. The first and the far most uh, important feature of politics of dialogue is, and as I said initially, that the purpose of dialogue is not to solve a conflict, rather to actually maintain the conflict in such a way that the violent aspect of the conflict can be reduced. So that is the first feature, that you need not to have violence, but it does not mean that you intend to solve it. So obviously, if, if a conflict is there, so there's a whole possibility uh, to have a violent conflict. But in order to reduce that violence, you say, fine, this is my position and that is your position. In such a situation, we can just sit down and talk. The purpose is not to solve the conflict, but to actually reduce the aggressiveness of this uh, or the volatile, volatile, uh, volatile to, to, to reduce the, uh, you know, the pressure that is created by the conflict uh, at a particular historical moment. So that's the first thing. That's the first feature of politics of dialogue. 
The second feature is that if the dialogue is continued for a long time, then each party would like to influence each other, not the way to convince each other, but to create a conducive environment in which their interpretation became the dominant interpretation. So I'll give you one example, and that would clarify what I mean by that. Uh, take, for example, the debate on Ram Temple and Babri Masjid. Initially, uh, if you go back to 1990s debate or uh, before that, before 1992, when the actual negotiation on the Babri Masjid case started, you find that the dominant interpretation was that, you know, uh, the demolition of Babri Masjid is bad because it goes against the uh, secular fabric of the country. And that was not merely the interpretation given by the secularist of this country, but also by the Muslim groups. So the Muslim groups who were actually fighting for Babri Masjid, they also made this point that, you know, because the dominant interpretation was that the demolition of a mosque is wrong because it is unlawful and at the same time uh, morally unjustifiable. But what is interesting is that over the years, some way or the other, the opponent party, uh, the Hindutva party, they became quite confident and they continued to engage with this issue. The Muslim party and the secularist, they actually reached to a situation as if they need not to engage with the issue. So that less of they, this lack of actually, they, this lack of actual engagement reduce their uh, influence over uh, the issue. And as a result, if you closely look at the judgment of the Supreme Court in the Ayodhya case, you find that it is not uh, because they did not produce the uh, those who were fighting for the Babri Masjid, they could not produce a legitimate argument that the uh, that this place was used for religious worship before 1857, which is a very simple thing. And if you go back to archive, you can certainly have records and you can produce them as evidence in the court. But that did not happen. Why? Because their engagement with the issue of uh, the secular engagement with the issue actually reduced. And at the same time, because the Hindutva forces were constantly engaging with the idea of Ram Temple, their interpretation survived. It means that if a dialogue is, you know, is, is extended to a very long period of time, the dominant, there is a possibility that the group that is in a dominant position would influence the proceeding and can actually change the entire uh, setup in which a possibility of dialogue is organized. Uh, I'll give you one another example. If you look at India Today's issue of 1993, January 1993, it is full of criticism of BJP and the Ram Temple. But look at India Today issue. Very recently, when the, uh, the judgment came out, it was celebrated the judgment. It simply means that there is a change in the way in which the conflict is seen and answered. So that's the second uh, feature of politics of dialogue in our case. The third feature is how a conflict is resolved. First is that the conflict is not resolved. You have to just reduce the you know, um, violent, uh, atmo you, you have to just calm down the conflicting party and create a dialogue. Second is that if the, what is the interpretation that is coming out, the, the meaning of conflict and the interpretation of conflict. And the final point is, suppose the conflict is resolved. Suppose the conflict is resolved, uh, then what is, in what ways the uh, solution is offered? For instance, if you look at, there is a very, again, I'll go back to the Babri Masjid Ram Temple issue. If you look at the so Supreme Court judgment, it very categorically says that it actually, this judgment is not based on history. This judgment categorically rejected the point that it is Astha Kaprashan. It says that uh, we have come to the conclusion that this place, this site is given to um, VHP and others or Ram Virajman on the basis of certain legal technicalities. That's the legal discourse. 
on the basis of certain legal technicalities that land is not that that very land is given uh, to the Ramdala Virajman, assuming that they would construct a temple. But at the same time, in order to compensate the Muslim party, five acre land is also allotted. Now, if we look at, but that's the legal interpretation. But what is the political interpretation? The political interpretation is completely different. It is seen as if that the Hindu forces have won. The judgment is presented to us as if that, in the, that the Supreme Court has now endorsed the VHP's initial remark that this is the Astha oppression of uh, or uh, in the belief that Ram was actually born at this site. But, you know, so you can see the manner in which a conflict is resolved through dialogue. So these are basically the three features. I am just flagging them. And now uh, I would like you to watch the film. It's on Kutum Minar and it has got English subtitle. So uh, you keep these, this, the, my initial framework and three features of politics of dialogue in contemporary India in mind. Watch the film and this is 30 minutes film and uh, then we'll have our uh, open session on that. So I'm going to share my screen with you. कहते हैं तसव्वुर और हकीकत में फर्क होता है तसव्वुर सिर्फ एक सोच है यकीन नहीं ऐसा होता तो वैसा होता ऐसा हुआ तो यूं हुआ और यूं हुआ तो क्यों हुआ غالب نے اس کشمکش کو کچھ اس طرح بیان کیا ہے کوئی مدت کے غالب مر گیا پر یاد آتا ہے وہ ہر ایک بات پہ یوں کہنا کہ یوں ہوتا تو کیا ہوتا تو کیا تصور صرف ایک خیال ہے اور حقیقت حقیقت نہیں محض ایک خاص طرح کا تصور ہے جس پر ہم سبھی یقین کر بیٹھے ہیں 
ये बोसीदा बेसुबान पत्थर जो खंडरात की शक्ल में तब्दील हो चुके हैं शायद तस्वुर और हकीकत की इसी जद्दोजहद के सबसे बड़े शिकार हैं कुछ दानिशमंद इन मुर्दा पत्थरों को तारीख का गवाह बताते हैं और इनके जरिए तारीख का एक ऐसा आईना बनाना चाहते हैं जिसमें हम गुजरे वक्त की नुमाया तस्वीर देख सकें कुछ ऐसे हम ख्याल लोग भी हैं जो इन खंडरों में अपनी जिंदगी के मसाइल का हल ढूंढते हैं इन अकीदतमंदों के लिए ये खंडर मुर्दा आसार कदीम नहीं जिंदा रूहानी मरकज हैं जहां वक्त ठहरा नहीं है और इन सब से परे तारीख के शहदाइयों का एक ऐसा तबका भी है जो इन खंडरात में हिंदू मुस्लिम माजी तलाश करता है कौमों की तारीख और उनकी विरासत के ये पैरोकार पत्थरों का मजहब तय करना चाहते हैं गोया हर गुंबद मुसलमान है और हर मूरत हिंदू अकॉर्डिंग टू मिस्टर वॉरन बफेट इन द स्टॉक मार्केट वेन द टाइड इज अप इतफाक ही है कि कहानियों और इमारतों में दाखिल होने के लिए एक दरवाजे का होना लाजमी है यूं तो खिड़कियों से कूद कर या खंडर हो चुकी दीवारों को फाद कर इमारत में दाखिल होने में कोई हर्ज नहीं है लेकिन फिर भी खंडर के तारीखी मैार और कहानी के अदबी मसाइलों की इज्जत का पास रखते हुए हमें उसी दरवाजे का रुख करना चाहिए जो दरवाजा वक्त के पहरेदार का काम करता रहा है इस दरवाजे का एक और काम भी है एक ऐसा काम जो शायद उतना मासूम नहीं जितना कि हमें लगता है दरअसल ये दरवाजा एक रहबर है जो तारीख दिखाता है तारीख बताता है और शायद तारीख बनाता भी है एएसआई या पुरातत्व सर्वेक्षण विभाग आम सैलानी को इस इमारत की एक दिलचस्प तारीख बताता है कुवैतुल इस्लाम इस्लाम की शक्ति मस्जिद के नाम से प्रसिद्ध यह इमारत भारत में स्थित प्राचीनतम मस्जिद है इसके सहन के चारों ओर दालान बने हैं जिनमें प्रयुक्त खंबे तथा दूसरी वास्तु सामग्री मूलतः 27 हिंदू एवं जैन मंदिरों को ध्वस्त कर प्राप्त की गई थी मेहराबों पर अंकित धार्मिक लेख जियामतिक एवं अरबी ढंग का अलंकरण है पर इनके गठन में हिंदू शिल्प की छाप स्पष्ट है ये सरकारी तारीख दावा कर रही है कि इस मस्जिद को बनाने का मकसद इस्लाम की ताकत को दिखाना था जिसके लिए हिंदू और जैन मंदिर ढहाने जरूरी थे तो क्या हिंदू और इस्लामी तहजीबें एक दूसरे से इतनी मुख्तलिफ हैं कि जो इस्लामी है वो हिंदू नहीं हो सकता और जो कुछ हिंदुस्तानी है उसका हिंदू होना लाजमी है क्या हिंदुस्तानी इस्लाम की कहानी हिंदू तहजीब की बर्बादी से जुड़ी हुई है सत्य को कभी छिपाना नहीं चाहिए और ये तथ्य और सत्य आज नहीं आरोपित किया गया है कुतुब मीनार जाने वाला व्यक्ति उसको पढ़कर भी आक्रोशित नहीं होता है प्रतिशोध की भावना में नहीं आता है सिर्फ इतिहास का एक ज्ञान जरूर होता है इस बात की पुष्टि जरूर होती है कि जब कुछ आक्रमणकारी भारत आए वो इस्लामी इस, इस्लाम पंथ से जुड़े हुए थे तो उन्होंने इस देश में आकर यहाँ के पूजा पद्धति को यहाँ के पूजा के स्मारकों को मंदिरों को ध्वस्त करना कर का काम किया उसका एक उदाहरण है लेकिन वह ध्वस्त हुआ इसलिए इस इमारत को ध्वस्त कर दें इसके चरित्र को बदल दें ऐसी प्रवृत्ति भारत के लोगों में नहीं मुझे लगता है कि ये हम नाइंसाफी कर रहे हैं हम ऑलरेडी जो एक, एक सैलानी है एक, एक टूरिस्ट है एक व्यूअर जो आया है हम अपना माइंड सेट उस पर थोप रहे हैं अगर हम ये बताए बगैर कि कितने मंदिर तोड़े गए थे कितने जैन टेंपल्स तोड़े गए थे ये बगैर बताए तो क्या ये बेहतर नहीं होगा मस्जिद के दरवाजे पर एक और बोसीदा सी इबारत लिखी है जिसके बारे में ना तो कोई गाइड बताता है और ना ही एएसआई का ऑडियो टूर इबारत की ऊपर की लाइन दरअसल कुरान की एक आयत है जिसके नीचे फारसी में मस्जिद का नाम और उसके बनने की तारीख दी गई है इसमें बहुत सी रोशन निशानियाँ हैं जो इस घर में दाखिल हुआ अमन में आ गया और लोगों पर वाजिब है कि महज खुदा के लिए खाना काबा का हज करें याद रखें कि खुदा सारे जहां से बेपरवाह है 
ये किला कुतुबुद्दौलत व उद्दीन आमिर उल उम्र एबक सुल्तानी ने साल पांच में फतेह किया और इस मस्जिद जामी की तामीर करवाई खुदा उनके मददगारों को ताकत दे इस मस्जिद की तामीर में 27 बुतकदों का सामान इस्तेमाल किया गया और हर एक बुतकदे की कीमत तकरीबन 20 लाख देलीवाल रही होगी अल्लाह इस मस्जिद के बनाने वाले पर अपना कर्म करे जिन 27 बुतकदों का जिक्र यहाँ किया जा रहा है उनका मजहब और मरतबा क्या था यहाँ हिंदू और जैन मजहबों का जिक्र क्यों नहीं है इस मस्जिद का असली नाम क्या है इबारत में इसे मस्जिद जामी कहा गया है न कि कुतुल इस्लाम एक और दिलचस्प बात है इस बुतखाने की कीमत कीमत लेकिन कीमत बताने के पीछे क्या मंशा हो सकती है क्या कीमत महज इसलिए बताई जा रही है कि बुतखानों की ऐशो इशरत बयान की जा सके या फिर माजरा कुछ और भी हो सकता है सत्ताईस टेम्पल्स चारों तरफ बिखरे हुए थे उनके रिमेन्स उनको इकट्ठा किया गया और उसको रिसाइकल किया गया आप ये भी कह सकते हैं कि 27 फ्री स्टैंडिंग टेम्पल्स थे जिनको डिमोलिश किया गया और उसका मटेरियल ला के आप ये भी कह सकते हैं कि इन दोनों का मिक्सचर है कुछ टेम्पल्स ऑलरेडी रोइन शेप में थे कुछ खड़े हुए थे तो उन्होंने सबको तो अगर उस इंस्क्रिप्शन को फॉलो करें तो उसमें कहीं सेंक्शन सिर्फ इस इंटरप्रटेशन का नहीं है कि मंदिर तोड़ करके उसका मटेरियल यूज किया अगर रोइंस बिखरे हुए हैं तो उनके लिए बहुत मुश्किल है ये तय करना कि ये जैन मंदिर है या दूसरे डिनोमिनेशन का इसलिए कि उनके पास कोई ऐसा एक्सपर्टीज नहीं आज भी जो स्कॉलरशिप है आर्किटेक्चर की या आइकोनोग्राफी की उसमें अच्छा खासा सीखना पड़ता है रिसर्चर को ये पता करने के लिए कि ये जैन है बुद्धिस्ट है या हिंदू है और हिंदू है तो किस स्कूल का या किस डिनोमिनेशन इस पूरे इलाके में बरियल हो रहे हैं बख्तियार काकी की वजह से कुतुब साहब का कुतुबुद्दीन ऐबक से कोई लेना देना नहीं है तो दिस वुड हैव बीन अ स्क्वायर काइंड ऑफ स्ट्रक्चर प्रोबेबली थ्री साइड्स पे कवर्ड वरांडा था फोर्थ साइड पे जहां पर आर्चेज हैं वहां पे कुछ साइड में कुछ रहा होगा एंड देन दी आर्चेज इन फ्रंट ऑफ आर्चिस जो है ये बात का एडिशन है ओरिजिनल नहीं है बिकॉज दी आर्चिस वर एडिड बाई अल्तमश मस्जिद का कंस्ट्रक्शन कुतुबुद्दीन ऐबक ने करवाया है फिर अल्तमश के बाद अलाउद्दीन खिलजी ने एक्सपेंड करवाया है उसने फिर एक और उसको जो आर्चिस थी उनको एक्सपेंड किया है ऑन बोथ साइड इट इज ओनली इन दर्ड एक्सपेंशन दैट द मीनार बिकम्स अ पार्ट ऑफ द मॉस्क ये मीनार उस मस्जिद का हिस्सा है ही नहीं ये विक्ट्री टार है एंड आई एम एब्सोल्युटली सर्टेन दैट दिस मीनार वाज नेवर यूज्ड फॉर कॉलिंग पीपल टू प्रेयर्स व्हिच इज अनदर मिथ क्रिएटेड बाय द जोकर्स हु टेल यू के वो इस पे चढ़ के अजान दिया करते थे दूसरे दिन रिजाइन करके चला जाता अगर संयुक्ता तो वो इस मीनार पे चढ़ा करती थी रोज तो तीन महीने के अंदर उसके घुटने खराब हो Law of attraction can create amazing results for people, and everybody knows that. But the sad part is, वैसे तो हमला किया अपने स्वार्थ के लिए, लेकिन फिर भी वो मज़बूत को नहीं बोलते थे। जहाँ मुसलमान आए और बसे, वहाँ मस्जिद की बहुत ज़रूरत थी। तो उस ज़माने में शायद एडहॉक आते होंगे और कोई आर्किटेक्ट नहीं कोई बिल्डर नहीं कोई कुछ नहीं फिर भी मस्जिद चाहिए तो भाई ये इमारत अच्छी लग रही है इसी को कन्वर्ट कर दो तो कन्वर्ट करना बहुत आसान है सेंक्टम सेंक्टोरम हटा दीजिए मूर्तियाँ तोड़ दीजिए और वो एंट्रेंस में गाड़ दीजिए ताकि लोग उस पर चले और मेहराब को इस्टेब्लिश कर दीजिए और एक मिन बार बना दीजिए तो ये मस्जिद हो गई मुझे तो सबसे दिलचस्प चीज कुतुब कॉम्प्लेक्स की ये लगती है कि उस जमाने के मुसलमान कैसे वो नमाज पढ़ते थे वहां मुझे तो लगता है कि वो कहीं ज्यादा उनका इकोमेनिकल और ओपन सेंस था 
ریلیجیوسٹی کا کہ چاروں طرف بت ہیں اور چاروں طرف ایسا مٹیریل جنس کے بارے میں ان کو معلوم ہے کہ وہ بت خانے سے نکلا ہے لیکن انہیں اس بات کا کوئی فرق نہیں پڑتا مجھے لگتا ہے کہ ہمیں یہ بھی غور کرنا چاہیے کہ اس زمانے کی ریلیجیس سینسبلٹیز کیا تھی ارے بھیا مسلمان مسلمان کہتے کس کو ہیں نام سے مسلمان کوئی ہوتا ہے سر پہ ٹوپی اوڑھنے سے لمبا جبا پہننے سے مسلمان کوئی بن جاتا ہے داڑھی ٹوپی رکھنے سے مسلمان کوئی بن جاتا ہے رہا مسئلہ چوری کا ساد اللہ خان کے سامنے کے جو مندر ہیں ماتا رانی کا تاج اٹھا کے لے گئے تھے مسجد کے امام ان نے بتایا کہ میرا ایک ریڈیو تھا جو ایک صاحب آئے اور انہوں نے کہا کہ بھائی ایسا ہے خلیل صاحب ایک جنازہ آ رہا ہے اور آپ تیاری کر لو تو وہ جنازے کی تیاری میں نکلے تو اتنے میں وہ اپنا چور جو ہے ریڈیو اٹھا کر لے گیا یہ پاپ ہے کیا یہ پن ہے کیا ریتوں پر دھرم کی مہرے ہیں یہ پاپ ہے کیا یہ پن ہے کیا ریتوں پر دھرم کی مہرے ہیں ہر یگ میں بدلتے دھرموں کو کیسے آدرش بناؤ گے سنسار سے بھاگے پھرتے ہو بھگوان کو تم کیا پاؤ گے اس لوک کو تو اپنا نہ سکے اس لوک میں بھی پچھتاؤ گے سنسار سے بھاگے پھرتے ہو اب سوال یہ ہے کہ کیا اس مسجد کی تعمیر کا تعلق ہندوستان میں اسلام کے پھیلنے سے ہے جینوئن مسلم بلیور ٹرو بلیور اس کی پرائیورٹی ہے اسلام 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 اس کے بعد میں میری فیملی اتادی تو وہ جو ہے اب ہندو کی پرائیورٹی ہندو ہندو کچھ نہیں ہے پرائیورٹی ایز میں اور اگر اچھا آدمی ہوں تو میں مکتی کیسے پاؤں اور اس کے بعد کچھ یاد آتا ہے مندر ایکچولی دھرم یاد نہیں آتا ہے اور اسلام کی خوبی اور سب سے بڑا کمال یہ ہے کہ اسلام جہاں گیا اس نے اس لوکل کلچر کو لوکل روایات اور ٹریڈیشن کو اختیار کیا اس لیے قرآن جو ہے وہ جو مکہ میں پڑھا جاتا ہے ضروری نہیں کہ اسی طرز طرز سے جو ہے وہ آذر باجران میں پڑھا جائے گا یا ہمارے یہاں بھی پڑھا جائے گا وہ تلفظ اس کے ہر جگہ تقسیم ہوتے گئے وہی تعمیر میں بھی اس کے ہوا رہن سہن میں بھی ہوا وہ جہاں گیا اس نے اسی چیز کو اختیار کر لیا کوئی بھی دھرم ایک لمبے کال کھنڈ تک ٹھیک وہی نہیں رہتا اس کے باوجود کہ ایک نام اس کے لیے چلتا رہتا ہے اسلام کے آگمن کے بارے میں یہ بات تو بہت ہی طے ہے کہ کوئی بہت ہی بڑا سانسکرتک پریورتن جیسے شروع ہوتا ہے اور وہ پریورتن ہمیشہ اس روپ میں نہیں ہے کہ وہ ایک طرح کا آکرمن ہے اور وہ ایک طرح کی وجے اور پراجے کی گاتھا شروع ہوتی ہے لیکن وہ بہت ہی کمرشلی پولیٹیکلی اکانومک کے لیے بھی کئی طرح کے پریورتن لانے والا ہے جو دھرم کی اور گیان کی کہانی ہے وہ ان کہانیوں سے الگ کبھی نہیں ہوتی علاؤدین خلجی کا ایک کانورسیشن ہے ایک قاضی کے ساتھ جس میں کچھ ایشوز فنڈامنٹل ایشوز ریز کیے گئے ہیں ریلیجن اور پالیٹکس قاضی بار بار اپنا ریلیجس پوائنٹ آف ویو پش کر رہا ہے اور علاؤدین بار بار اسے ڈینائی کر رہا ہے تو بادشاہ نے کہا میں مسلمان ہوں میرا باپ مسلمان تھا میرا دادا بھی مسلمان تھا لیکن اسلام نے کیا کہا ہے حکومت چلانے پہ مجھے اس سے کوئی مطلب میں اپنی حکومت ان اصولوں پہ چلاتا ہوں جو میں نے بنائے ہیں جن کو میں سمجھتا ہوں کہ میرے رعایا کے لیے بہتر تو داڑھی ٹوپی تلک چادر ان چیزوں سے جو ہے راجا کو نہیں ناپا جا سکتا راجا جو ہے وہ جنتا کے ساتھ ہے اور فیصلے وہی ہوتے ہیں جو جنتا کی آستاؤں کے مطابق ہوتے ہیں وہاں مندر توڑے بھی جا سکتے ہیں مسجدیں بھی توڑی جا سکتی ہیں اور وہ ساری سوال جو ہے آستھا کا سوال بن کے آ جاتا ہے اگر آپ امیر خسرو کی نوح سے پہر یا قرآن و سادین دو بڑی مصنویاں پڑھیں تو آپ کو تعجب ہوگا کہ اس سے زیادہ بڑا پیٹریٹ تو کوئی ہو ہی نہیں سکتا ہے اس کے امیر خسرو کی نظر میں ہندوستان سے بہتر کوئی ملک ہی نہیں ہے ہندوستان 
کی عورتیں سب سے خوبصورت عورتیں اور یہاں کے کا فلورا فاؤنا سب سے اچھا پھر وہ دلی کی تعریف کرتے ہیں تو دلی ان کے لیے سب سے اچھا شہر ہے جامع مسجد دلی کی سب سے عمدہ مسجد ہے ایسی مسجد ہے جس کا طواف کعبہ کرتا ہے اگر اس زمانے کے مذہب اور عقیدے آج سے الگ تھے تب بت خانے توڑنے کے پیچھے کیا وجوہات تھیں اتہاس کا ریچرڈ ایٹن اور فلپس وینگر کہتے ہیں اس دور میں دشمن ریاست کی عبادت گاہوں خاص کر مندروں کو تباہ کرنا ایک عام بات تھی دراصل مندروں کو ڈھانا اپنے آپ میں کوئی خاص قسم کا سیاسی عمل تھا ہی نہیں بلکہ اس زمانے میں دشمن ریاست کو فتح کرنے کا مطلب ہوتا تھا ہارے ہوئے راجا کی حکومت کا پورا صفایا چالک کے راجا سومیشور کے سمان میں لکھے تیرویں صدی کے گرنت منسولسا کے انسار ہے راجن یدھ میں وجے کے پسچات شترو کی رازدھانی کا ودوانس عوشم بھاوی ہے راجا کا محل سندر بھون راج کماریوں کے آواز عدیقاریوں کے گھر گھوڑوں اور ہاتھیوں کے استبل اور یہاں تک کہ راجے کے مندروں کو بھی جلا کر کھاک کر دینا شریس کر ہے It is possible کہ محمود غوری نے مندر توڑے جب بھی حملہ ہوتا تھا تو جو جیتنے والا ہوتا تھا وہ ہارنے والے کی ریلیجیس پلیسز کو ڈیمولش کرتا ہے اور اس کا وہ اس یہ نہیں ہے کہ اس کی جو پرجا ہے اس کو وہ مسلمان بنانا چاہتا ہے تو جب آپ کسی کو ہراتے تھے You had to establish that your God was stronger than their God. One more thing that added to the looting of temples was the tremendous wealth that temples had. So you had to sleep in the jungle. 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 Dark spots, redness, uneven skin tone and early signs of it. We all have to get more sun exposure. کسی بھی کھنڈر کا تاریخی عمارت یا سنرکشت مونیمنٹ بننے کا مسئلہ دلچسپ بھی ہے اور پیچیدہ بھی سو سال یا اس سے پرانی کسی بھی عمارت کو قانونی طور پر راشتری مہتوہ کا سنرکشت مونیمنٹ قرار دیا جا سکتا ہے اگر عمارت ویران ہو تو اسے نون لیونگ مونیمنٹ اور اگر آباد ہو تو لیونگ مونیمنٹ کہا جاتا ہے مونیمنٹ کا مذہب تیہ کرنے کا کام اور بھی الجہ ہوا ہے اے ایس آئی سے تعلق رکھنے والے انیس سو اٹھاون کے قانون کے مطابق اگر عمارت مذہبی طور پر آباد ہے اور اس کی دیکھ رہے کوئی تنظیم کر رہی ہے تب اے ایس آئی کا کام صرف عمارت کی دیکھ بھال کرنا ہوگا اور عمارت میں مذہبی ریتی رواج پہلے کی طرح جاری رہیں گے اس کے برقس اگر عمارت مذہبی ہے اور وہاں کوئی پوجہ ارچنا یا نماز تو ہو رہی ہے لیکن اس کا کوئی وارث نہیں ہے تب اے ایس آئی نہ صرف عمارت کی دیکھ بھال کرے گا بلکہ وہاں چلنے والے مذہبی ریتی رواجوں کے لیے بھی ایک تیہ شدہ نظام بنائے گا ڈیٹ آف نوٹیفیکیشن یعنی وہ تاریخ جس دن اس عمارت کو مانیومنٹ قرار دیا گیا اس معاملے میں بے حد اہم کردار نبھاتی ہے ڈیٹ آف نوٹیفیکیشن کے دن اس عمارت میں چلنے والے مذہبی ریتی رواج سے ہی اس عمارت کا مذہب تیہ ہوتا ہے لیکن اگر عمارت ویران ہے اور ڈیٹ آف نوٹیفیکیشن کے دن وہاں کوئی پوجہ ارچنا یا نماز نہیں ہو رہی ہے تب عمارت کو نون لیونگ مانیمنٹ مانا جائے گا یعنی لاو یہ کہتی ہے کہ جب ہمارا آدمی دیکھنے کو گیا اس عمارت کو وہاں اگر یہ پوجہ ہو رہی تھی تو وہ اس فیت کا مانا جائے گا اگر یہ ہو رہا تھا تو وہ اس فیت کا مانا جائے گا اگر جس وقت اس کو معاینہ کرنے کو انسان گیا وہاں مسجد میں نماز نہیں ہو رہی تھی تو کیا ہم اس سے یہ انفع کریں کہ یہ مسجد نہیں ہے کیونکہ اگر ایسا ہے تو تو یہ بہت ہی نیرو انٹرپیٹیشن ہے لاؤ کی آدھنک دلی ہے اس میں جب گھوشنا ہوئی کہ دلی بھارت کی رازدھانی ہوگی اس کے بعد دو تین طرح کے سوال تھے ایک تو زمین چاہیے تھی نئی دلی کے لیے وہ زمین دکشن نہیں تھی یہاں انہوں نے آخرکار 
बनाया नई दिल्ली को 1911 में राजधानी की घोषणा हुई 1913 में एएसआई का सर्वे शुरू हो गया तो बहुत सारे इमारतों का सर्वे हुआ कि इनका लोगों की जिंदगी से क्या रिश्ता है और इसके लिए कितने कॉम्पेंसेशन दिए जाए ताकि जो जमीन लेने की प्रक्रिया है उसमें कोई बाधा ना आए बाद में कुछ ऐसी इमारतें हैं जो मस्जिदें रही होंगी उनको लेके एक और सवाल खड़ा हुआ कि जो एस के पास चली गई उसे नमाज पढ़ सकते हैं या नहीं पढ़ सकते हैं तो अलग अलग तरह की जो इमारतें हैं उनके साथ अलग अलग रिश्ता था लेकिन मेन ये था कि वो जो राजधानी बनेगी वो अपने पावर को कैसे दर्शाए और जो जमीन लेने की प्रक्रिया है वो कैसे वो ढंग से कर सके मेरे हिसाब से इन सारी प्लेसेस ऑफ वर्शिप को लिविंग मॉन्यूमेंट बनाने में कोई प्रॉब्लम नहीं है आइए प्रे कीजिए चले जाइए फिर यह होगा कि वो इमाम साहब कहाँ रहेंगे इमाम साहब के लिए घर चाहिए फिर एक मोजदिन चाहिए फिर झाड़ू करने वाला चाहिए अब यहाँ दस लोगों की आबादी हो गई तो पानी चाहिए बिजली का कनेक्शन चाहिए टॉयलेट चाहिए इसे सोर से कनेक्ट करो उसके बाद बाहर एक दुकान लग जाएगी पान बीड़ी सिगरेट की अगर वहाँ एक कबर है तो चादर और फूल बेचने वाला आ जाएगा आप देखिए कि मस्जिदों की शायद किल्लत है वाकई क्योंकि अगर आप फ्राइडे को निकल जाए दिल्ली में खासी मुसलमान आबादी है यू कॉन्ट डिनाई दिस दिल्ली में जो आबादी है उसमें से बहुत से ऐसे लोग हैं जो जुमे की नमाज अदा करना चाहते हैं जो उनका पूरा हक है इसमें किसी को कोई शक शुबा गुंजाइश है नहीं अक्सर बड़ी आबादी जहां मुसलमानों की है मसलन कालका जी के इलाके में मस्जिदें कम हैं तो फिर लोग नमाज फुटपाथ पे या सड़क पे अदा करते हैं उससे भी लोगों को इतराज़ है तो इसका सल्यूशन क्या है क्या आप ये कह रहे हैं कि लोग नमाज ही ना अदा करें तो अगर मस्जिदें कम हैं तो मेरे ख्याल से इसमें कोई हर्ज नहीं है अगर एक रेगुलेटेड तरीके से एस आई के के कब्जे में भी जो मस्जिदें हैं उनको आप जुमे की नमाज के लिए खोल दें मस्जिद हो मंदिर हो चर्च हो गुरुद्वारे हो सब में अलाव होना चाहिए एज पर रूल उसका यूज वही रहेगा करेक्टर वही रहेगा नेचर वही रहेगा तो वो सब अलाउ करना चाहिए इनको पब्लिक के लिए और मैं ये समझता हूँ कि उसमें कोई नुकसान नहीं है बल्कि वो चीज़ मेंटेन होती है तो अगर मुसलमान जितना अपना घर से लगाव रखता है उतना ही अपने मुल्क से लगाव रखे ज़्यादा नहीं तो हमें काफ़ी है अगर आप इंसाफ चाहते हैं और मुसलमानों से वापस मांगना चाहते हैं कि भाई ये हमारा मंदिर था प्लीज़ छोड़ दीजिए जो हो गया हो गया तो उसमें तगड़ा सबूत होना चाहिए संघ ने आज तक यह नहीं कहा कि तमाम सभी स्मारकों को ध्वस्त किया जाए जो हमारे तीन पूजा के स्थान हैं जो काशी विश्वनाथ कृष्ण जन्म का मथुरा और भगवान राम की जन्मस्थली अयोध्या तीन मंदिर इसलिए नहीं चाहिए कि हमें प्रतिशोध है तीन मंदिर इसलिए नहीं चाहिए कि हमें मस्जिदों को तोड़ना है या बदले की भावना है तीन मंदिर इसलिए चाहिए ये तीनों प्रतीक भारतीय सभ्यता और संस्कृति को प्रतिबिंबित करते हैं धर्म से अधिक इतिहास की कई बातों पर हम जानते समझते हुए आंख और कान बंद करना पड़ता है तभी हम एक विरासत को एक समरसता में परिवर्तित कर देते हैं कभी कभी हम वर्तमान को भूत के संदर्भ में देखते हैं और, और भूत को वर्तमान के संदर्भ में देखते हैं तो ये व्याख्या हमेशा गलत होती है मैं मानता हूँ जिस दिन पहल के आधार पर सामाजिक सौहार्द के आधार पर इन तीन मंदिरों का समाधान निकल जाएगा मुझे लगता है कि संगठित रूप से इस तरह की कोई मांग ना होगी अगर हम खाली उसको मजहबी तौर पे मस्जिद के तौर पे ना भी देखें तो हम इस तरीके से उसका अंदाज़ा लगा सकते हैं कि वो हम हमारे इतिहास का एक गौरवशाली हिस्सा है अब उस गौरवशाली लोगों ने अपने तरीके से देखा कुछ ने इसलिए तरीके से देखा कि मंदिरों को तोड़ के बनाया गया कुछ ने इस तरीके से देखा कि नहीं एक मुस्लिम हुक्मरान की है अजीम तर इमारत और कुछ ने इस तरीके से देखा कि उनकी भावनाओं को आहत करके बनाया गया लेकिन उस वक्त की तमाम तर सूरत हाल को निगाह में रख के हमको देखना पड़ेगा कि क्या वजह थी कि उस वक्त के क्या हिंदू इतने कमज़ोर थे कि एक बादशाह आता है उन मंदिरों को तोड़ता है और तोड़ने के बाद उन्हीं से कहें कि आप इसकी तमीर कीजिए ऐसा नहीं था कहीं ना कहीं इसमें जो लोकल पॉलिटिक्स थी वो भी इसमें इन्वॉल्व थी और फिर मैं अर्ज़ कर रहा हूँ कि कवतलाम को इस्लामी नुक़ः निगाह से देखना इस्लाम के साथ ना इंसाफ़ी है ये तथाकथित लोग जो रोज़ाना इतिहास अपने बंद कमरों में बैठ के लिखते हैं उनसे इतिहास को जो है नहीं सीखा जा सकता इसलिए इस देश को इसके कदीम तर इतिहास जो रचा गया है उसके तौर पर देखना चाहिए 
पाकिस्तान में क्या हुआ बगदाद में क्या हुआ मेरा मानना वो नहीं मेरे हिंदुस्तान में क्या लोगों ने करा उस चीज़ को जब देखेंगे तो मैं समझता हूँ कि एक अच्छा इतिहास में हमारा हिस्सा बन जाए इन इमारतों का एक और काम भी है और वो है रोजमर्रा की जिंदगी को जीना हम अपने घरों से छुप छुप के वहाँ क्रिकेट खेलने जाया करते थे बच्चे सब बाकायदा टीम बनाकर वहाँ क्रिकेट खेला करते थे और डर भी लगता था कि मज़ार पे मत चढ़ना इसकी बेहरमती होगी बॉल अगर जाती थी तो झुक के उसको उठाने की कोशिश करते थे कि उस पर मज़ार पर ना चढ़ें लेकिन शाम होते ही वहाँ दहशत तारी हो जाती थी और ये यकीन था हम लोगों का कि यहाँ पर भूत परत रहते हैं उसमें जूते लेके जाते हैं कपल्स बैठते हैं वहाँ पे आ, कपल्स जो है वो दुनिया भर की तमाम तरह बातें जो तनाई में की जा सकती हैं जिस लिए वो जाते हैं वो सारी वह हरकतें करते हैं तो तकदस तो आ, ना ही तो मुसलमान बरकरार रख पा रहे हैं तो दूसरे लोगों से शिकायत करने की क्या मसला है और जहाँ तक जिम्मेदारी की बात है मैंटेनेंस की तो आज के दौर में अगर किसी को कुछ फ़ायदा होगा तो कुछ करेगा इस एरिए को बर्बाद करने के लिए सब जिम्मेदार है गवर्नमेंट भी है पब्लिक भी है सेमी गवर्नमेंट भी है स्टेट गवर्नमेंट भी है और सब कम्युनिटी के लोग भी हैं इमारतें मोहब्बत करना मोहब्बत के लिए बाहें खोल देना और मोहब्बत के जज्बे को अमर कर देना भी जानते हैं हर इंसान जो इश्क करता है वो मानता है कि उसका इश्क अमर है अमर है वो मर नहीं सकता ठीक है वो मानना चाहता है खाम ख्याली हो लेकिन वो मानता है उस अमरता की वो निशानी छोड़ना चाहता है कोई ताजमहल बनवाता है कोई ताजमहल पे अपना नाम लिख देता है तो ये जो बना हुआ है ऑलरेडी एक अमर कृति बनी हुई है उसमें अपना नेम प्लेट लगा करके है ना आप अपने आप को अमर कर लेते तुम गुलाब का क्या जवाब आपका जो अदा है वो बहार है आज दिल की बेकली आ गई जुबान ये है तुमसे प्यार है दिल तुम्हें को दिया रे प्यार का राग सुनो रे कुतुब तो मीनार हो या इस तरह की कोई भी स्मारक हो आ, वे बुलाते हैं अपनी तरफ हम उनकी तरफ जाते हैं उनका एक आकर्षण है उनका स्थापत्य है क्योंकि वो रोज रोज़मर्रा की चीज़ें नहीं हैं वो अलग से खड़े हैं और यही उनकी खासियत है दूसरी तरफ वहाँ जा कर के ये इतना सीधा खेल नहीं होता कि हम सब एक कुतुब मीनार देख कर के लौटते हैं शायद हम सब अलग अलग कुतुब मीनार देख कर के लौटते हैं कुतुब दरअसल एक ऐसा अधूरा अफसाना है जिसके अधूरेपन में ही वक्त के ढेरों मायने चुके हैं वाकई तस्वुर और हकीकत का फर्क बेहद पेचीदा है क्या भूलूं क्या याद करूं मैं अगणित उन्मादों के क्षण हैं अगणित अवसादों के क्षण हैं रजनी की सोनी घड़ियों को किन किन से आबाद करूं मैं क्या भूलूं क्या याद करूं मैं दोनों करके पछताता हूं सोच नहीं पर पाता हूं सुधियों के बंधन से कैसे अपने को आजाद करूं मैं क्या भूलूं क्या याद करूं मैं क्या भूलूं क्या याद करूं मैं क्या भूलूं क्या याद करूं मैं
documentary there i am sure there must be a lot of questions you all have you may raise your hand one by one and ask your questions yeah. okay you may go first so thank you for presenting such a wonderful uh, documentary film it's really informative and i have a lot of reflections on this particular documentary film uh, the first aspect which i really admire there was one statement uh, saying that there is a difference between reality and imagination that's really uh, thought provoking by looking at uh, the huge structure and the imagination that we go through and the reality which is really in place and there was another one um, like every uh, temple uh, uh, mosque or church there is an entrance but that that entrance is only a guide uh, that guide they are not the eternal places all these uh, non living uh, monuments are like guides uh, that help us to go beyond what we really uh, worship mm -hmm. and then Uh, that one thing i i really felt it a uh, bit uh, uh, discouraging how long can we really give up those uh, monuments as saying that they are only uh, 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 a place but they also carry a lot of history and they carry the values of people uh, i felt that uh, being a kind of a discouragement for me because the moment that we give up maybe the opponent can take uh, a override on my desire of uh, giving up and then the ending part ending part also is very inspiring what should i remember what should i forget uh, because human human history from the beginning uh, carries a lot of uh, 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 heritage a lot of uh, traditions so in course of time there are so many uh, things which are uh influence which are misguided deviated so we are really confused in in fact what should i remember and what should i carry i i, I really i i admire that particular phrase thank you yeah uh before i think it's <clears throat> basically a comment and uh, uh before you ask your questions uh, let me just quickly uh, remind you that we are here actually to discuss politics of dialogue and the purpose to uh, introduce you to this particular documentary uh, is to uh, highlight something that is not very contested the way uh, in which the other sides are uh, but at the same time there is something called everydayness of that building so in that context how one particular aspect is highlighted and stretched in and then interpreted politically and how that aspect is very different the way in which we envisage a particular site or a building so that was the purpose and this is what the three points which i initially made actually uh, take us back to uh, this idea the dialogue you know remember that 
uh, what uh, Rakesh Sena was trying to say that you know dialogue is important and there is there is only a matter of three buildings but the other guy who was also um, a bjp former bjp mp he said very categorical that now we need uh, and because he wrote a book uh, it's called hindu masjid in which he identified 3500 uh, temples that were converted to mosque etc now uh, if we just go back to the three points which i highlight uh, I think that makes sense in that context. So when so the question you ask is actually in relation to the uh, wider discussion which we initially had. Yeah. Okay. So uh, and thank you very much, Aruka. Uh, I really like. I'm glad that you like our effort, uh, and uh, I think you captured uh, something that was very close to me personally. The two things that actually we are introduced to any building. Uh, with its gate, because the gate and the introductory history written over there is something that would force you to imagine the entity that is inside rather differently. And what to remember and what to forget is something it is up to us, you know, able to solve the issue. So therefore, the purpose of this documentary, as well as the purpose of this lecture, is to think closely about how is historical questions are politically posed. And what, what could be the political answers to that? Because if you go back to history, history is full of contestation and full of overlapping. Uh, so therefore, history cannot be the answer to this or the solution to the issues which we encounter. Okay, who is next? Rajan is next. Rajan, you may ask your question. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh First of all, I congratulate and express my gratitude that you point out some of the important metaphilosophical issue, how to have dialogue or what is the purpose of dialogue. Sir, I have certain you know, uh, challenges which I would personally face if I would go and propose any kind of thesis from a religious point of view or from, a, from an argumentative aspect. aspect. The first one is... Uh, as you started your lecture, uh, you propose a thesis that uh, dialogue is not all about or overcoming the conflict, rather they reduces the probability of aggression and so on. Sir, my first uh, challenge would be if I propose this thesis to anyone would be that, you know, when I am uh, assuming that uh, dialogues are not for the purpose of overcoming conflict, is that then what is the purpose or what kind of, you know, uh, what should be the categorical point to which I can uh, move forward? Take, for instance, I would give you two examples. I worked on my PhD thesis, you know, what is the purpose of dialogue? So my, uh, my uh, central thesis was that, you know, uh, there is a famous uh, Indian method methodology which says that vade vade jayate tattu bodha. It means that when we have dialogue, we aim to uh, reach the truth. So when two parties have been having any sort of dialogue, they first of all set a truth and then they, tr they try to have a dialogue and then they try to reach the truth. So first of all, we, we have to set the agenda. We have to set the truth that what sort of truth we aim to reach. So this is the uh, you know uh, popular uh, philosophical approach to having dialogue. Same Theses have been proposed by the Greek thinkers. Socrates also aimed no, for I think what is your question? Uh, I, uh, I, I don't get your question. Okay, um, I'll, let me uh, elaborate it. That the, your thesis is somehow based on the assumption that dialogues are basically a way of interpretation. However, I, I am suggesting that the dialogues are basically aimed to reach the truth. So how would you say that? Because, you know, if you that will be your... If, if you will try to base your thesis on the basis of uh, interpretation, then I do not think we may have any kind of final interpretation. There would be some sort of, you know, disorganization on this thesis. This would be the first challenge, which I am, uh, you know, proposing from my side. What would you so say on this thing? My second uh, question, which I have been constantly, you know, facing throughout this, uh, you know, course is that, you know, when we approach the history, somehow we consider it quite neutral. 
but i think that history haven't been neutral in any sense either it is power dominating or it is dominating with our imagination or it is dominated with our emotions so how we may basically take this uh, as a challenge you know take for an instance the south asia the this whole geographical area yeah, i get your point I, i i get your point i get your point so these are the two things which you were asking yes sir yeah first of all i didn't say that dialogues are insignificant i didn't say that initially my purpose is to understand uh, and i said very categorically initially that uh, i am talking about dialogue in relation to Uh, the political debates i didn't say that dialogues are completely insignificant or there is no value to that rather my purpose was to look at the politics very specific politics of dialogue so it has not it does not contradict what you are saying so that let me just clarify that the second question which you are raising is important and if you look at closely uh, the manner in which we have addressed this question in this documentary is precisely this obviously history cannot be the answer Uh, first of all what is the structure of uh, what we call history so therefore past i always make a distinction between past and history and uh, past is something which is a very wider entity and history is only one way to address that so there could be another a number of different possibilities by which you can enter into the realm of the past so therefore i would agree with you that history is not history the way in which history with, with capital h cannot be the answer to the question which we encounter in our everyday life that is i don't have any problem with that having said that uh, it does not mean that the history is insignificant history is also important history is also very crucial but we have to look at in what ways a question is asked and what is the level um of that discourse which we called history obviously one discourse which we call history is is, is academic history where every interpretation is subject to multiple every uh, finding is subject to multiple interpretation in that sense there is a procedure to arrive at a conclusion so that is an academic realm in which history is placed but there is something else the political history where nation constructs their history and propagated that historical facts as final truth i have a problem with the second uh, notion in which history is used so this is my response to you and you know sir you uh, earlier in the beginning of your lecture you also proposed the three elements of having dialogue the agency yeah the but i said you know that these were actually uh, if you remember closely uh, i also said that i am talking about the manner in which the idea of dialogue is seen with regard to uh, political debates and that's the reason why the state became very important in that context yeah, yeah sir but in the uh, in a typical or in a formal debates as well the organizers organizers cannot be accepted as neutral they also seem to be biased yes. so there is problem between you and me the problem yeah. is that actually uh, initially what my purpose was basically to raise a few abstract questions and when i introduced the documentary to you i wanted that these issues must be contextualized and presented with concrete evidence so that's why uh, i do not do theory the way in which the other do meaning that a uh, jump from one mass abstraction to second abstraction for me a theoretical statement is certainly there but this theoretical statement would become uh, meaningful if we linked it to the concrete historical and sociological processes and this is what i did so i said i couldn't understand your point you know i'm really sorry you know uh, obviously if you continue to engage with me uh, in an abstract manner and raising question uh, with regard to something that is abstract it would become completely you know i'm not i cannot uh, make any statement of a universally applicable type so my statement of Uh, my theoretical formulation or the framework which i offered 
was or is is contingent upon uh, the kind of work which I do and the kind of empirical reality which I am engaged uh, I am engaged with, and that's the reason why. Uh, I think that's a theoretical problem because for, for me, uh, theory is coming from uh, the generalization of empirical realities. I'm not moving from one theory to another theory. And that's the reason why we both are, uh, you know, that's the reason why uh, your unease is coming from. Raghya? Yeah. I, uh, so I have just a small couple of questions. Uh, one is um, that, uh, you know, sometimes some dialogue practitioners actually say that um, if, uh, if two people, if two parties, even if they're coming with an ulterior motive, even if they're coming with, uh, with a certain, um, uh, you know, with, with the wrong intentions into a dialogue uh, process, but the very fact that they're coming to the table um, it is it itself is a success of a dialogue and something will move. Um, so I want to I want your I mean you know your views on this. Uh, would you consider it you know maybe half a success or some kind of a movement or is it if you're if you're approaching a dialogue with a uh, process with the wrong intention is it is it completely futile? And the second is uh, in the documentary we saw that there's a lot of critical thinking that goes on. Um, but usually in, in, in uh, real life, what we see is that there is constant, uh, people view everything as black and white and, you know, it, it's all homogeneous. They do not see context. They do not see where it was coming from. So what can we really do? Um, what can be done really to, uh, you know, to invoke this critical thinking and this, uh, this process in which people can contextualize um, what happened at a certain point of time? Yeah, thank you very much for uh, your question. Uh, basically, uh, I think you should not get this impression that I am uh, undermining the uh, significance of dialogue. Dialogues are certainly very important. But my point is to look at dialogue from a very different vantage point, the vantage point of politics. So, uh, as I said, uh, to Rajan that uh, obviously uh, I think uh, again you are offering a hypothetical situation and that too uh, in which you are saying that two individual or two parties are coming together. Uh, I don't actually it all depends on the concrete issue involved in this case. Only then we would be able to assess the politics or the three important dimension of politics of dialogue. I underline. So therefore, I am, I, you know, these hypothetical, you know, there is no universal theory of dialogue, by the way. So I am not, and that's the reason why, and this is my response to Rajan as well, that I am not proposing that, you know, these three elements are going to be universally applicable. First. Second important thing is that I am not at all interested uh, in um, making any sweeping statement. Uh, about the insignificance of dialogue. Dialogues are certainly important, but at the same time, the possibility to have, uh, uh, to use them in the realm of politics must be also understood properly. Now, with regard to your second question, could you just repeat your second question again? Yeah, I was uh, just basically that uh, people tend to view uh, situations, uh, you know, in absolute black and white terms and in, with a lot of homogeneity, whereas we see that there's a lot of context why a certain thing happened, that's what the documentary said. So what can be really done to invoke more critical thinking, you know, in the masses? Not critical thinking, solution-oriented thinking. And solution-oriented thinking is simply this, that the manner in which two different kind of people live together, two group of people live together, in a particular environment. So, for instance, uh, if I would say that Hindus and Muslims are living in India, this is a simple statement, but there could be interpretations of it. One interpretation is that Hindus and Muslims are two civilizations and they always fight with each other despite the fact they live together here in India. 
The second interpretation would be equally problematic that there is a complete harmony between Hindus and Muslims. I think these two, you know, there, there could be third possibility. The third possibility is that Hindus and Muslims live together the way people live together. So there would be a possibility of conflict as well as the possibility of reconciliation. So I think either celebrating conflict or celebrating oneness is equally problematic. Thank you so much. Thanks. Roke, do you have a question again? Sir, I don't know if I am reasoning out well. I would like to think aloud with you. Uh, there are dialogues on every dimensions of our life. There are dialogues on culture, dialogues on uh, religions, traditions, uh, uh, and nationalities and everything. Uh, yeah, man is a political being, therefore he is part of uh, politics. I don't know if we can uh, give up this notion of uh, politicizing. Can we really have a proper dialogue? Mm, I don't, uh, because I think, again, your statement is coming from a rather universalistic interpretation of dialogue and manhood. So I, uh, I'm not interested in that. For me, uh, you know, the concrete reality and the processes are important. And only then we can think of some kind of a meaning because the production of meaning is inextricably linked to the concrete social processes in which we live. So thinking aloud is also important and it should also be done in relation to the reality or the processes which we encounter in our everydayness. So I think, again, it's a difference of uh, vintage point. Thank you. So do we have any more questions for Dr. Ahmed? Pushpika. Pushpika. Yeah. Uh, Thank you so much, much sir, for the wonderful session. And I don't have any question as such. I was about to ask the same question as Pragya asked the second question. What, what can be done to, you know, really infuse this uh, categorical, you know, critical thinking in the masses so that they would also understand that uh, everything is not black and white. Life is, I think, gray. And I just want to thank you for, uh, you know, uh, uh, highlighting this point and I really love this point that you know celebrating conflict and celebrating oneness are equally problematic and I think this is a wonderful statement because this is such a reality and I and I immediately felt like okay even we also think that way I mean we are also sort of connected with this kind of mentality that things should be either way like it thumbs up either things should be correct or incorrect but I think uh, you know, the way to lead the process or the way to really move ahead in any conflict is to get into the fact that, uh, you know, things can come from both sides in the mid of the solution. I mean, getting, uh, getting to uh, threads and then binding it could be a solution rather than saying either one thread is wrong or other thread is wrong. So, yes, thank you so much for bringing that point. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Pushpika. Uh, I'm glad you like uh, our work. Uh, basically, you know, again, uh, let me retreat or elaborate the answer which I gave you. Uh, to, in fact, the answer I gave to Pragya. Uh, you know, I think that uh, I think that the critical thinking is something. Uh, you know, I'm not. Um, I don't, I don't think that, you know, people are not as critical, you know, as we think they are, but they are common people. They are, this is not their business to uh, come forward and offer solution to the issues which they, in fact, for them, this is not at all an issue. Uh, I'll give you one example. Over the years in our surveys, we asked this question, what is the significance of Babri Masjid for Muslims? And we find that it is gradually become insignificant. And same is the case with Hindus uh, in our surveys. 
that they were not at all interested in that issue. But suppose a person who is a Hindu and he is or she is told that a temple is going to be built on a certain site. It is natural for him or her to be happy because obviously if it is a religious place of worship, fine, that is being built. So he or she would celebrate it, but it does not mean that he or would become anti-Muslim. So I think that this grayness of uh, this gray area again is also important to be recognized. So uh, if we continue to, for example, what is the dominant discourse at the moment? The dominant template in which reality is explained in contemporary India is Hindu versus Muslim. And most of the time we are forced Forced to actually think only in terms of Hindu versus Muslim or Hindu equal Muslim, etc. But I think in order to understand the complexities of our everydayness, we need to get rid of this template, distance ourselves, and look at the things from a different point of view. And that point of view is the uh, you know, what is the location of religion and culture in our everyday life? We, me, because, you know, my Muslimness uh, is not very, you know, I, I do not worship my Muslimness every day in order to come to my place of work, in order to teach my students, in order to travel in a metro or in a, uh, on, on roads. So I think that various kind of attributes of my identity are there. These attributes force me to think differently. Now, the political class would like us only to focus on our religious, religious self-attribute as if that's a defining feature. The point is that in whenever, it, whenever the question of critical thinking comes, it is very important that we also highlight the multiple identity attributes an individual has. And only then we can tell him or her, uh, um, by the way, there is another important issue which I do not want to, I would just flag it uh, because there is something called lack of political morality at the moment. Uh, the lack of uh, social morality. There is a serious decline of morality and that's the reason why Obviously, people are idle. They, 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 uh, they always need some kind of a leadership to come forward and tell them that this is right and this is wrong. Now, we have reduced the idea of leadership to the political leadership in such a way that the possibility of addressing social issues has completely gone. That's another aspect. And that's the reason why uh, the idea of critical thinking has not yet been fully utilized. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks. Anybody else who would like to ask a question? Rajan, did you raise your hand again? Yeah, ma'am. Uh, I just wanted to, uh, you know, ask again on the, I would like just an analysis from Sir's point of view, what his uh, stand on the idea of concrete reality. So on the one hand, he is talking about- What is your uh, background? What is your uh, background? Philosophy, sir. Philosophy, yeah. yeah. Uh, see, uh, one statement and then, uh, which is my favorite statement, by the way. Uh, this is statement is engraved uh, on the tombstone of Karl Marx that philosophers have interpreted the world in different ways. The point is how to, how, the point, however, is to how to change it. Now, for me, I think that uh, for the way in which I look at philosophy uh, is different from your vintage point. So we will not be able to solve this conflict at all. Though, and that's the reason why, uh, and this is actually a problem of, uh, I would say vintage point. So your vintage point is, I'm not saying that it is wrong. Your vintage point is equally valid, but my vintage, it, it does not 
have, I do not have uh, any space to accommodate that vantage point in my analysis. So therefore, we are coming from two very different vantage points and we must respect each other's uh, differences. Yeah, but sir, in the modern time, we are talking about how to have a collaborative approach, interdisciplinary approach. You know, CP knows wrote that again. Two again, you are actually telling me. Again, you are but, telling me the textbook things, which I am not interested at all. Okay, that's okay. Thank you. Okay, so with this, we come to the end of the session. Thank you so much for sharing this. Um, very interesting. I think interesting is an understatement for this documentary. A lot of us have been to visited the Qutub Minar maybe several times for school picnics and whatnot. Yeah. Have never been able to look at it, look at the monument uh, the same way, and we won't be able to look at it the same way again, as well. So you've changed uh, a lot for every school going uh, person in Delhi. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Himmat, for taking out time for us and sharing your views. Thank you so much.